Good morning and welcome to our services for March 29th, uh, Sunday morning. <clears throat> our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let's come before our God in prayer. Our merciful God and heavenly Father, you are the one who spread the heavens, uh, who has set the earth on its firm foundation where it cannot be moved. You are the one who says to the sea, here and no further. And we pray this morning, Father, that you would bless us as we meet with you, that you would bless the reading of your word, the preaching of your word today. We pray, Father, that you would bless our congregation, that even though we are uh, apart from one another, uh, you would join our hearts together in love and in prayers and in true unity, that you would bless those who are struggling with illness, bless those who are fearful, that you would give courage to those who are doubting and afraid and uh, be a comfort to those who are lonely. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would strengthen our faith today, cause us more and more to trust in your only begotten Son, whom you sent to take disease and death and pain and suffering upon himself, so that we might come boldly into your presence. Until that glorious day, Father, we pray that your word would continue to go forth like rain on dry ground, that many might cast off their idols and trust in you alone. We pray, Father, on the one hand, that you would give wisdom and strength and courage to those in high places making important decisions, that you would give them wisdom. And on the other hand, we pray that you would bless the people of our state, uh, that they would be at peace, uh, that they would be uh, calm, uh, that you would send a spirit of uh, calmness and of peace, uh, restrain crime and evildoers, uh, restrain those who are rebellious and those who are hard-hearted and those that the scripture calls sons of Belial. And we pray, Father, that you would give peace that we might live peaceable and quiet lives, even as things are changing everywhere. We pray, Father, that we would, first of all, submit ourselves to the governing authorities as you have commanded us to, uh, for we know that they are here for our good. And second of all, Father, that you would teach us that they are but human beings, men and women, uh, who make mistakes, who sin, who do uh, uh, inconceivable things, and yet we recognize that it is your will to govern us by their hand. And so, Father, we pray that you would give us grace and peace uh, in these difficult times. Above all, Father, we pray that we might know you. Uh, we might hallow and magnify your name in all your words, in all your works, and that you would deliver us from the taunts and the snares of the evil one. Protect us from this virus. Give us our daily bread. Provide for all of our needs. And whatever the future holds, Father, we pray that you would grapple us to your bosom and never let us go. Hold us firmly in your hand and never release us. For we know that you are the good shepherd and we are the sheep of your pasture. You are our God and we are your people. Teach us to trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. My scripture reading this morning is Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 takes place uh, after John's vision of the throne room. In chapter 4, he sees the creator of heaven and earth high and lifted up on his throne, surrounded by the angels, reigning over all things. Uh, and then he is given this vision in chapter 5. Let's give attention to the reading of God's word. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book, written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much. Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and on the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. 
And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are as in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever and the four beasts said amen and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever How often in our lives have we cried out uh, with the psalmist, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul also is sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? How often it seems that heaven is silent. We know that this earth under the sun is full of labor and care and toil, anxieties, fears, Oftentimes we're like ships being battered about by winds that never end. And we think to ourselves, as only, if only there was a way to enter into the throne room of God and see what is going on. Job once cried this in Job 23. He says, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I may come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. In this section of the book of Revelation, chapter 4 through 6, John is taken to that seat, into the throne room of God. Like Job, though, he finds that in the presence of God, every mouth is stopped. But John gets a glimpse of the plan of salvation from beginning to end, because it was revealed to him by God for all of us. Isn't this what we all wish for? The answer to the question, what is going on? How does this all end? Is there a point? Is there a plan? And God has not left his people in the dark. Jesus said to his disciples in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, he says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. But the plan of God in the salvation of the world cannot be put in sound bites or slogans or memes. Last week I talked of the uh, wisdom, the almighty eternal wisdom and knowledge of God. How none of us have access to every single plan in the universe. But it's common in times of crisis to pick out a few verses and try to apply them to our life and to our situation. Scripture doesn't work like that. No writing does, actually. You cannot pick up a book by Charles Dickens and randomly open it to a page and pull out a sentence that you think sounds nice and think by that you have understood the writer. And how much less would you be able to do so with the author of divine scripture? All of scripture as a whole, the work of one author, it's the work of God through many human authors, but ultimately it is the divine word of God. And it all reveals God, it all reveals Christ, and it all reveals salvation from the beginning to the end of the world. The problem with our understanding of the book of Revelation is that we too often try to start with the book of Revelation and try to make sense out of it. But Revelation is a culmination of centuries of images, poetry, songs, sights, and sounds from all previous revelation given to us in the Old Testament and in the Gospels. This morning I hope to bring to life a tiny piece of that. Talk about what John saw in the throne room. 
and hopefully it will bring us some comfort. After his description of the throne room in chapter 4, which I will discuss at another time, uh, John gets to the heart of the vision. We see in chapter 4 that the one on the throne, the one ruling over all things forever and ever and ever, who does all his good pleasure, uh, who works in all the kingdoms of this world and is over all, king of kings and lord of lords, we see him in chapter 5 holding a book in his hands. That book, of course, would be a scroll. The scroll would be rolled up and then sealed on the edge uh, to show that it was authentic. This particular book has seven seals holding it closed. It can't be read until those seven seals are broken. Seven is a prominent number in Scripture. God created the world in six days, Moses tells us, and rested the seventh day. We can read about that rest in chapter 2 of Genesis. And man was created to enter into that rest, to dwell with God. But, of course, man failed and was cast out of God's presence. Since then, our longing, our be, our, everything that we have longs and cries out for a return to Eden. All that we long for as human beings can be summed up as we long to be in the presence of God. And the number seven is used throughout Scripture to refer to that rest in the dwelling place of God. Everything that's involved in being in God's presence, where God is, that rest that Moses spoke of in Genesis 2. A good example of that use of sevens is found in the conquest of Jericho. That's the first city of the Canaanites to be destroyed. The Canaanites had to be driven out of the land before Israel could enjoy their rest in the land. The land of Canaan was a picture of the new heavens and the new earth, as we see in Psalm 95. And in the conquest, we see the nation of Israel marching around Jericho for six days. Then on the seventh day, they marched around it seven times. And on the seventh time of the seventh day, the walls fell flat and Israel entered into that rest. That rest was called God's rest. Later, the picture would be given more fully as Mount Zion, where the temple of God and the throne of David were together. A picture of God's presence and God's rule to teach us that the place of God's rest, His dwelling place, is the place where He reigns over all things. The whole world is under His authority, His might, His power, His dominion. That's what John sees in chapter 4 of Revelation. But the conquest of Canaan was just a picture. The fact is mankind has not entered into that eternal rest yet. Mankind has not entered into the Sabbath rest yet. As the writer of Hebrews says, there remains yet a rest for the people of God. And he also says if Joshua had given them rest, he afterwards would not have spoken of another day. And the reason that mankind has not entered into that rest is because of sin. Unbelief, rebellion, refusal to bend the knee. As Psalm 95 says, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So we know as the church of God, we are headed for the rest that God has provided for his people. We know that sin will be taken away. We know that we will be cleansed. And we know that we were created to dwell in Mount Zion, Zion in God's presence forever. The question is, how do we get there from here? That's what's written on this scroll. What's written on the scroll is God's plan of salvation in all of history. It's, 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 uh, it covers everything. The scroll is written on every single bit of it, front and back. It covers all of history. Why is the word scroll used? That word is a figure used several times in Scripture. For example, in Ezekiel chapter 2, Ezekiel says that he looked, and behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein, a scroll. And he spread it out before me, and it was written, writ, written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. In that scroll that Ezekiel sees, it's covered with the 
events of all the nations, everything that's coming, the destruction, the movement of kingdoms, everything that's about God's plan and God's decree that was about to take place. But out of those lamentations and woe came the salvation of the remnant of God's people. And so Ezekiel describes the taste of it as being sweet. In the book of Daniel, Daniel sees a vision of all the coming kingdoms. And he sees the one kingdom ruling over all kings forever and ever. And at the end of that book of visions, in chapter 12, he writes, And I heard, but I understood not. And then I said, Oh my Lord, what shall the end of these things be? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So there we have the key to unlocking why John sees a scroll. This scroll is God's decree. The cleansing of the world, the renewing of all things, the coming kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that leads us to that day, from the movement of kings to the flapping of a butterfly's wing, to nations, everything. And that decree is far, far more than simply going to heaven when we die. Because eventually it involves the restoration of all things, as we shall see. It involves the great vision that John sees at the end of the book of Revelation, where all things are made new, where every tear is wiped away, and hell and death and the devil and his angels are cast into the lake of fire forever. But we don't know any of that as long as the book is sealed. One other point on this, the scripture also tells us that the words of God and the works of God are one. They're not divided. God does not make a plan and then refuse to carry it out. God's plan of action and God's decree of action are all the same thing. So by saying that it is sealed, John is saying in a great mystery that this plan of action this plan of the restoration and salvation of the world will not take place until the seal of God's decree is opened. If the decree is not sent forth, the redemption of all things does not take place. And the decree, therefore, will not go forth unless someone is found worthy to open the scroll. And this is why John wept greatly. John wept greatly because if no one is found worthy to open the scroll, then we all end in death and misery and slavery and bondage. And John looks, and there's no one. Verse number, uh, verse number 3 and 4, No man in heaven, nor on earth, neither under the earth, no one anywhere, no creature, was able to open the book and undo the scrolls. This is explained in plain words in our Heidelberg Catechism. The world is under the curse. It's under the judgment of God. And in question 12 we read, Since then by the righteous judgment of God we deserve temporal and eternal punishment. How may we escape this punishment and be again received into favor? And the answer is God wills that his justice be satisfied. Therefore we must make full satisfaction to the same, either by ourselves or by another. And question 13, can we ourselves make this satisfaction? By no means. On the contrary, we daily increase our guilt. 14, can any mere creature make satisfaction for us? None. For first, God will not punish any other creature for the sin which man committed. And further, no mere creature can sustain the burden of God's eternal wrath against sin and redeem others from it. So then what kind of mediator and redeemer must we seek? One who is a true and righteous man, and yet more powerful than all creatures, that is, one who is also true God. This is what John sees in a vision. He sees no one worthy to open the scroll, for who can take the punishment for sin against the whole human race? It cannot be a mere creature that can bear the eternal wrath of God. It cannot be another sinful human being. We can't do it ourselves, for we daily increase our guilt, and every human being is born of Adam and inherits Adam's guilt. How is it possible for anyone to open the scroll? How is it possible for anyone to bring about God's plan 
of salvation and redemption. There was one. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the mystery that the prophets like Daniel longed to see. It wasn't revealed in Daniel's time. Until Christ came into the world, no one was worthy to open the scroll and bring apart the salvation of mankind. A lot tried. Alexander the Great tried. Nebuchadnezzar tried. Julius Caesar tried. Caesar Augustus tried. Many of the kingdoms and nations of earth were simply trying to bring about a return to Eden. But none of them were worthy to open the scroll. For none of them bore upon themselves the wrath of God against the sin of the whole human race, and that sword must fall. But then the one who was in the form of God took upon himself the form of a servant, as we read in Philippians 2, and was obedient unto death. And it says, Then God highly exalted him, this God-man, true God, true and righteous man, the sword of God's wrath fell on him, and so God exalted him, gave him what the book of Acts calls the promise of the Father, which was the Holy Spirit, and gave him authority over all things. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Once again, referring to so many passages in the Old Testament. He's called the lion, the conqueror, the heir to the throne of David, the warrior king, Ariel, which is Hebrew for the lion of God. The root and offspring of David. And John looks to see this great conqueror when the, when the elders say, look and see. And he turns to see the great conqueror and there's a lamb. The lamb is slain, but living. And I'd like to pause right there for a moment and talk about the significance of this lamb. The first time we're introduced to this lamb is at the first Passover. Israel is in hard bondage to the Egyptians. But we read God remembers his covenant. God remembers them. God has compassion upon his people. And after the nine plagues, God's ultimate plan is revealed to Moses, and he tells the people. God says, I'm going to go through the entire nation of Egypt, the entire land of Goshen, and I'm going to kill the firstborn everywhere. All the sheep, the oxen, the beasts, the kings, the princes, the captains, the servants, the criminals. Every family living in Egypt. Every tribe living in Egypt. And he says not even God's people would be spared. Because they are sinners and under the threat of death. But because they are God's people. God provides a substitute. And he reveals that substitute to them. He says, take a lamb. Watch it for five days to make sure it's without blemish, without spot. without spot. Then kill that lamb, take the blood, and sprinkle it on the door. Then get your family together, get your neighbors together, get everybody that will listen together, and get them in the house, and eat that lamb. As you shelter under the blood of that lamb, when the angel of death goes through Egypt, he'll see your house and he'll see the blood on the door, and he will pass over you. The angel of death wouldn't ask if the people inside the house were worthy. He wouldn't even ask if they were all Israelites. The only thing that mattered was, is the blood on the door? And when the blood was on the door, the people of Israel were redeemed from their bondage. It ends up with Egypt in chaos, grief and death and pain and misery everywhere. But Israel walks free as the people of God, celebrating the first Jewish Sabbath, the day they leave Egypt. Kings and priests, holy unto God, when they stand at the foot of Mount Sinai, God says to them, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, 
and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The lamb dies as a substitute, and God redeems his people. Now this redemption of his people also involved the drowning of the Egyptians. As Moses sang, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. That, of course, was only a picture of the true battle. The true battle is far, far greater. The kingdom of the devil must be overthrown, as I've said many times from this pulpit. This battle at the Red Sea was only a glimpse of the true battle. And the Lamb was not sufficient. For Israel didn't keep the covenant. They disobeyed the covenant over and over again. They didn't enter into the rest because of unbelief. Eventually their sins became so great that they were vomited out of the land. And the fact is we need a greater Lamb. We need a greater covenant keeper. We need one to obey in our place and inherit the land for us. We need a righteousness that's not our own. In other words, we need a lamb that's worthy to open the seals. And this is who the Lord Jesus Christ is, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. He was obedient unto death in our place. He paid the penalty for sin in our place. And therefore he alone is found worthy to open the scrolls. In other words, to bring about God's redemptive plan of salvation for the whole world. As he told his disciples before he ascended into heaven, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples. As the church of God, we rest under the covering of his blood. Like Israel, redeemed from bondage by the Passover lamb, so the church of God is redeemed from the bondage of sin and misery by the blood of the Lamb of God. Today is Lord's Day 13 in our Heidelberg Catechism readings. Our catechism on this day reads, question 34, Why callest thou him our Lord? And the answer is, Because not with gold or silver, but with his precious blood, he has redeemed and purchased us body and soul from sin and all the power of the devil to be his own. We belong to him. Body and soul in life and in death for he has purchased us in order to redeem us. He is the lamb that has redeemed us and made us kings and priests. Read again the song in verse number 9 of Revelation 5. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hath made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. What a glorious picture. There's much to see here, but there's one more thing I would like to point out. The description of the lamb back in verse 6. He's described as having seven horns and seven eyes. And then John explains that as being the seven spirits of God. Now we can sit around here and guess what he means by that. We can speculate what he means by that, but I would rather look at the scripture. Throughout Scripture, the eye is used as a metaphor of seeing clearly, understanding, wisdom, knowledge. Horns throughout Scripture are figures of power. The rams fought with their horns, and those became symbols of power. The horn of Jesse is the power of King David. So the question is, does the Scripture have anything to say about this lamb who is the root of David, the lion of Judah, and his anointing with the Holy Spirit that can give some insight to what these eyes and these horns are. Well, the first passage I would like to direct you to is Isaiah chapter 11. 
Listen closely to Isaiah chapter 11. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. There's the seven eyes. Perfect wisdom and understanding, counsel, might, knowledge. It says the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. This Lamb has perfect wisdom and perfect knowledge. For this Lamb is Jehovah Himself. And here, in, the only one that can have that description, the branch arising out of Jesse, the branch coming from King David, is also true and eternal God. With all the attributes of God, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The second passage I would like to direct you to is Isaiah 61. Listen closely to this. Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint them that mourn in Zion, giving them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And there are the seven horns of the lamb that was slain. When he began his ministry, he quoted this verse and applied it to himself. He said, The Spirit is upon him. The Lord has sent him and filled him with his Spirit to do this sevenfold task. Preach good tidings to the meek. Bind up the brokenhearted. Proclaim liberty to the captives. Open the prison. Proclaim the jubilee of Jehovah, the acceptable year of Jehovah, to comfort those that mourn and to set those who mourn in Zion for beauty and joy and gladness. It doesn't come through as clearly in the English as it does in the Hebrew. But in the Hebrew it says, The Lord has sent me, and then there are seven phrases governed by the infinitive to do these seven things. Just as the Passover lamb of old redeemed Israel from Egypt, so the lamb of God has redeemed us from sin and misery and the bondage of the devil. This is the great conqueror. This is his seven spirits poured out, his sevenfold task anointed with seven eyes. A figure of speech, of course. This means that his power is perfect and everywhere present and will accomplish everything that he purposes to accomplish. And what he will accomplish will be beautiful and wise and full of understanding and knowledge for those eyes see you. Those eyes see our situation. Those eyes see the whole earth. There's nothing that misses his glance and nothing outside of his power. Deliverance, peace, freedom, comfort. This is the omnipotent and omniscient power of the Lamb of God. And it's all poured out upon the earth for the purpose of redeeming a people for himself. He hath redeemed us to God by his blood. In order for there to be a king and a kingdom, there must be three things. A king, a people, and a land. This was all symbolized in the Old Testament. The king, King David. The people, the nation of Israel. The land was the land of Canaan. But it pointed to something far greater. It pointed to our true king in heaven. Jesus Christ who is now reigning over all things. The only one worthy to open the seals. And the people. Which he is even now gathering. From every kindred, every tribe, every nation, every tongue. By his seven eyes and by his seven horns. 
calling his people together, protecting them, preserving them. And the end result is the redemption of his church and the new heavens and the new earth. That end result is described in chapter 21 and 22 of Revelation. He says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And moving down to verse 22. And I saw no temple there, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth to bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination to make a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life." Just as it was pictured in the deliverance of Israel from Egypt, the Egyptian army drowned in the sea. The Canaanites were destroyed by the fall of Jericho. And then Israel entered into rest. It was a picture of our great, wise, omnipotent, holy king destroying all that defiles, cleansing all that is defiled and part of the curse, and preserving and gathering and defending a people for himself at the same time. Paul wrote that God hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Ephesians 1 verses 22 to 23. And as we go on, John will describe what these seals are. Those seals are opened in chapter 6. And it seems quite strange to us because things don't work out the way we would like them to work out on this earth. That's why we have to remember that the lion of the tribe of Judah has perfect wisdom, perfect love, perfect beauty, perfect understanding, and perfect power. But the seals are strange to us. For when the seals are open, the first one we see is the conqueror on the white horse with a sword coming out of his mouth. That's the lamb slain. The conquering warrior, pictured differently. But following that conqueror, in service to that conqueror, are death, famine, plague, war, sickness, all those things that cause us such unrest. John's original readers were suffering from tremendous persecution. We also know there were plagues throughout the world. There was famine in Jerusalem. There was exile and war in the world. And what John sees from the throne room is the message that he would give the whole church. God has a glorious plan of renewal. God will restore that which we lost because of our own sinfulness. And all of that authority is put in the hands of of the one worthy to open the seals, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ is redeeming his people. He's redeeming his people by his blood. He's redeeming his people through plague and war and sickness and famine. And all the things that are involved in a cursed world are not out of the control of the one worthy to open the seals. He is working out this glorious renewal and this glorious future. God's justice must be satisfied and it will be satisfied. But God is also merciful and compassionate. The Lamb is coming in judgment, we read at the end of chapter 6. Well, the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. There's another picture of the Lamb. He is coming in judgment. But until that day, he is sealing each one of us so that not one of God's people will be lost. They are being called, redeemed, delivered. 
And he calls to each one of you and says, Come unto me and rest. The first time in this world, he comes to release the prisoners. His seven spirits are bringing comfort to those who mourn, comfort to those who are oppressed, deliverance for the captives. And he's saying, Come to me and rest. For those seven eyes and the seven horns are still gathering, defending, and preserving a chosen communion. A chosen communion. That's what we know. And we also know that death, fire, war, famine, plague, tribulation, all of those things eventually work together for the salvation of God's people and the judgment of the world. And that is good. And for that we can rejoice even in the midst of our tears and our uncertainty. Christ will come. This present age will pass away. Pharaoh and his armies and the curse, the devil and his angels will be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. And not one of Christ's sheep will perish. Until that time, the Holy Spirit is still proceeding from the Father and the Son, preaching good tidings to the meek, binding up the brokenhearted and proclaiming liberty to the captives and so on. And when we say, what is going on in the world? That's what's going on. What's going on in the world? Here's what's going on. Christ is preaching good tidings to the meek. He's proclaiming liberty to the captives. He's opening the doors of your prison. He's proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord. Now you are acceptable to God. If only you will come to Christ and put the blood on your door. He's comforting all those who mourn. And he's taking away your ashes. And he's giving you beauty. What's going on in the world? That's what's going on in the world. Let us pray. Our gracious God and merciful Heavenly Father, teach us even in the midst of our tears and our loneliness and our pain and our isolation to look to you and rejoice for the day will come when the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, and we will be gathered around your throne forever and ever where there will be no more curse. Father, sometimes that is difficult to see, so we pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would give us love and joy and peace and long-suffering and patience as we wait for you, knowing that you are good. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.